What do you get when DJ Ferb mixes some of the most popular Phineas and Ferb songs? Perhaps the most underrated song of the entire series, Foot Stomp Mashup. Look at them, they're stomping their feet. Look, look at them, they're stomping their feet. Look at them, they're stomping their feet. 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 It's a fun day. Yeah. This episode, just like the song, is an absolute jam. You won't believe the amount of Easter eggs and references hidden in plain sight. In this breakdown, I'll point out all the little details that you might have missed in what's my favorite Halloween episode of Phineas and Ferb. Welcome back to Channel 626. I'm Mitchell, and in honor of Ferbtober, we're breaking down Drusselstein a week. Right off the bat, there are a ton of changes to the title sequence. First of all, it's infused with eerie organ music, guitar riffs, and other spooky sounds. Generation is finding a good way to spend it. There's also this purple hue that's tinting the edge of all of it. And instead of panning up to the sun, we get the moon instead. And several of the voices we hear are distorted. Like me. This skeleton shows up a bunch. Some sometimes replacing other characters, and sometimes just being in the background. Instead of finding a turtle unicorn, they find this zombie goblin thing hiding behind a tombstone. And the background on this robotic dog is now a spooky hillside rather than their backyard. They paint their parents' car purple with a skull on the side. And in the background here, we see scenes from several other Halloween episodes, like the monster of Phineas and Furbenstein, One Good Scare Ought to Do It, concept artwork from Are You My Mummy, and others. There's also an RIP 2006 headstone. I'm not exactly sure what the 2006 is for, but it's possible that it's referencing the death of the creator's previous life as Phineas and Ferb debuted in 2007. That's just my best guess. The foliage behind these scenes looks like monsters and wolves with glowing eyes. And Candace is, as always, self-aware. Phineas and Ferb are making a Halloween special. We see spiders drop from the top, a zombie arm pops up from the 2006 grave, and it closes with bats swarming the camera, which reminds me of the intro of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? Now let's jump into the story. We start at the Flynn Fletcher home where we see a weird wax figure perched on the top of their roof. Inside, Lawrence says, If you need anything, your mother and I will be here scaring the sugar out of the little trick-or-treaters. And we learn at the end of this episode that he meant it literally. Because they scare the trick-or-treaters so badly that they drop their candy, essentially scaring the sugar right out of them. Or out of their bags, at least. And it turns out that Lawrence was carving Perry's face into the pumpkin, which is adorable. This leads us right into Perry's Halloween adventures. He thematically jumps into a pile of leaves to enter his lair. And in the background, there's a black cat sitting on the fence, just another symbol of Halloween that we see in this episode. Down in his lair, Perry gets instructions from Major Monogram, who's in a Carmen Miranda costume. Carmen Miranda was a Brazilian actress, singer, and dancer who's famous for her signature fruit hat. Somehow, Carl chose the exact same costume, which causes Major Monogram to say, Obviously, I've got to find a new costume. Thanks a lot, Carl. And the next time we see him, he's changed into a knight. When Carl walks in, he's saying, Sir, I found your dosimeter. It was... What are you doing? A dosimeter is a device that measures radiation, so I'm not exactly sure why Major Monogram has one. When we first see Doofenshmirtz, he's handing out candy to trick-or-treaters and comically misidentifies all their costumes. Class dunce with a fake scar. He was clearly dressed as a wizard, and the scar that Doof references must mean that he dressed up as Harry Potter. And you must be the princess of Meatland. She was clearly Lady Gaga in her meat dress. And, uh, or upset rooster head. And this guy was probably an angry bird. But his reaction to the last trick-or-treater is the best. And what are you supposed to be? A kid in a sheet? A platypus in a sheet? Perry the platypus in a sheet! And I love this one especially because when he finally realizes that it's Perry the platypus, he gets a little smile on his face. In fact, they don't even fight in this episode. Doofenshmirtz introduces their adventure for the evening. It's from my great aunt, Henrietta Hockenschmidt. She left it to me in her will. Look, at listen to this. To Heinz Doofenshmirtz, you are my only nephew, except for Roger, and I hated him. I leave you my castle, and hidden inside is a very large treasure! I guess Heinz did have one family member who loved him, which begs the question why he he didn't go live with her instead of the ocelots. It's hilarious that Doof asked how they got the moat on the plane. Who delivers a moat? How do they even get that on a plane? Insinuating that they got a whole castle on the plane. To get Perry to help him on the treasure hunt, he says, Take off your secret agent hat just for tonight and put on your adventure hat. <laughs> Which is funny because one, it's the exact same hat, and two, it's based on Indiana Jones's adventure hat. Perry figures out the first clue is referring to the chairlift, which shoots Doof straight up and he hits the window without breaking it, which is a reference to a clip from Gremlins, but in that instance, she actually flies right through the window. When Doof eventually falls into the moat, he finds the next clue, but gets chased by an alligator, kind of like Captain Hook. But the really funny part about this is what Doofenshmirtz says. Get away, 
Apparently, this alligator named Susan is the same one we met all the way back in season one. Although there, he refers to her as a crocodile instead of an alligator. Why don't you say hello to my new pet crocodiles? Susan and Susan! I named them after each other. They follow this clue to an elevator where a pair of twins creepily walk out and right past them, which is a reference to the famous horror movie, The Shining. And the elevator ends up being a reasonable facsimile of what the Tower of Terror feels like. Doofenshmirtz finds the next clue the same way that he found the first, falling into a moat and being chased by an animal. And after Perry figures out the last clue, they find the treasure. It's a good thing that Doof brought Perry with him because if you look back, he actually didn't understand any of the clues himself. What kind of twisted gibberish is this? I really don't remember an elevator down here. Well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Why did she make us come all the way up here? What does she mean, turn the corner? It's just a flat wall. And when Doofenshmirtz gets a hold of the treasure, he pulls a Daffy Duck. I'm rich! I'm comfortably well off. I'm rich. I am rich. I am comfortably well off. But his fortunes don't last long because several agencies come to collect. Which, strangely enough, all of the fees are for one canvas bag with a huge dollar sign on it. Doofenshmirtz here is becoming an analog for any adult who's looked at their paycheck and realized how much money is being deducted from various different places. My favorite one here is the Department of Bureaucracy, which is exactly what it feels like when you're talking to a government agency. Department of Bureaucracy. Ah. Although to be fair, he definitely does deserve the parking fine. Parking fine. There you go. Because we see a no parking sign outside the moat earlier. Meanwhile, during the treasure hunt, Vanessa's hosting a Halloween party inside that castle. She starts by inviting her boyfriend, Monty Monogram, and they tell each other what they're costing. Costumes are gonna be. I'm checking out my Queen of the Vampires costume even as we speak. Great, I'll be there. I'll be dressed as the Scarlet Pimpernel. Which is hilarious because Olivia Olsen, who plays Vanessa, also plays a vampire queen in Adventure Time. And Monty's father is Major Monogram, meaning he's dating the daughter of his father's sworn enemy. So just like the Scarlet Pimpernel, he's living a double life shrouded in secrecy. And apparently he and his dad must have watched a lot of old movies. Oh come on, Carmen Miranda! You know, you really should watch more old movies. The Scarlet what? You know, he wears a big red hat with a feather in it. You should watch more old movies. Candace shows up to the castle party also wearing a vampire queen costume and learns how Vanessa is pulling it all off. All I had to do was call the best party planners in town. Ferb, you hit the 440 junction box. Which makes perfect sense because Phineas and Ferb do throw the best parties. Candace then comments, 8-2, Vanessa. Which is a famous phrase from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. 8-2. Brute. And is something that Candace also said in an earlier episode. At two, Grandpa? Vanessa mistakes Jeremy for Monty because he's also wearing a Scarlet Pimpernel costume. You're not my boyfriend. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were mine. Jeremy! It's me, Candace! And then Stacy shows up also as a vampire queen, and so she leaves to go change. I'm gonna go change. But it wasn't just them. Apparently, everyone had the same costume idea. There's quite a bit of Halloween groupthink happening in Danville this year. Later, when Monty actually does show up, he and Vanessa share a dance to a song with strangely specific lyrics. When a vampire queen locks her thirsty eyes on a pimpernel. But I guess since most of the people are in the same costumes, it's broadly applicable. Go figure. And while they're dancing, they bump into Major Monogram. But when he goes to confront them, Stacy has stepped in in her new costume to preserve the secret. And she plays the ultimate trump card by referencing the fact that she knows exactly who Major Monogram is. Oh, hello, Mr. Water and Power Guy. Which is a callback to a previous episode where she learns Perry's secret and all about Alka without getting her memory erased. We're with the city and there was a swamp gas incident here. Uh, we'll just get it all cleaned up and get out of your head. Psst. Hey, Carl, we're not gonna need the mind erasing device. I, I mean. And Monty makes a swashbuckly exit, landing in the moat, but strangely enough, doesn't get chased by an alligator or a hippo. That was really kind of swashbuckly. Well, let's hope she didn't see that. Meanwhile, Phineas and Ferb are throwing the best Halloween party in Danville history. When they told their dad they were busy, they definitely weren't kidding. Come on, Ferb. We have work to do. Phineas says, Ferb, you hit the 440 junction box hooked up behind the riser, and I'll go check up on the pumpkin crudités. A 44 junction box is an electrical box that they're likely using for Ferb's EJ light show later on. And crudités are raw vegetables usually served on a platter as appetizers at parties, so presumably they're serving raw pumpkin. But later we see just normal crudités being served. And the food here is all laid out on a coffin table. Phineas calls Isabella. You're Isabella Rella. And in classic Phineas fashion, is completely oblivious to Isabella's Cinderella themed advances all through the night. We do hear him say, There's some water on the floor over by the sally port. And a sally port is a single point of entry on a castle or fortress. Buford and Belgique are both in a dragon costume, and Irving's in a castle costume at a castle party. Buford calls Irving Windsor. Hey, Windsor. Referring to the Windsor Castle. And is a true bro by alerting him that his castle fly is down. Your drawbridge is down. 
Oh my. How embarrassing. And then we get my favorite part of the episode. Let's kick this biggest, baddest, Halloweeniest fashion in high gear. <laughs> It's a spa day, yeah. Shiatsu. Thank you very much. We got a soft grub, a butt tub. What's it gonna be? A foot bath, a facial aromatherapy. It's a spa day, This song is a mashup of several Phineas and Ferb classics, including Squirrels in My Pants, There's Squirrels in My Pants, Ain't Got Rhythm, Spa Day, It's a Spa Day, Yeah, It's a Spa Day, Yeah, I'm Lindana and I Wanna Have Fun, and I Wanna Have Fun, I'm Lindana and I Wanna, Wanna, Wanna Have Fun, Yippee Kaya Yay, yeah. yeah. That's Wing You Turkey, That's Wing you turkey you with the daughter of my sworn verb is a killer dj with an awesome mask that is probably a reference to dead mouse and marshmallow he later changes into the same costume he wore in de plane de plane and sings a romantic song for vanessa and monty when a vampire queen locks her thirsty eyes which must have been hard for him because ferb and vanessa eventually end up as a couple and they've already met at this point and ferb has shown some interest and this part of the song is a riff on beauty and the beast it's a story But Vanessa and Monty aren't the only ones who dance. We also see Candace and Jeremy doing their classic dance. And Phineas finally wises up and dances with Isabella. Ginger, wearing her sister's costume from a previous episode, is dancing with Baljeet. They have shown interest in each other previously as well. All right, now let's run through everyone else that's in attendance and some of the background details, because there's a lot. The Angry Birds guy who is trick-or-treating at Doofenshmirtz. A dragon who looks like the robotic dragon in A Hard Day's Night. A hula dancer from The Backyard Beach. The Egyptian-themed employee from Are You My Mummy. The robot mermaid and nurse from my boyfriend from 27,000 BC, Thinkies and Speckies from Nerds of a Feather, people from the Tristone area, which I'm not exactly sure how that one makes sense, and Drusalstinians from the Dunkleberry Imperative. In fact, I think all the background characters are from a previous episode. And the tombstones that come out are an allusion to the tombstones that are outside of the Haunted Mansion, where there are funny names and sayings that often rhyme on the headstones. Here we read, this is Jake, who had a pet rattlesnake, this space for rent, here lies Rob, how is that for macabre, Stu, it was good, but now it's through, poor little fly was stuck in a pie, and some others that we can't really make out. There are also dancing ghosts, just like the Haunted Mansion. And the big question about this episode in my mind is, when does it take place? It's clearly on Halloween because we see kids trick-or-treating, making it one of the few episodes that doesn't take place in the summer. But if we're to assume that all of these adventures that Phineas and Ferb have happen over the course of one summer, that's when things get complicated because we've seen another episode take place on Halloween, which will be the next breakdown video that I do, so make sure to subscribe. In that episode, Perry's Lair and the Alka headquarters are decorated the exact same, but everyone's in different costumes. It's possible that both of these episodes take place on the same Halloween day, although it's not confirmed. Either way, this is my favorite Halloween episode. Let me know in the comments what your favorite background character was. I've got you covered this Ferbtober as we inch closer to Halloween. And if you missed my last Ferbtober video, make sure to check it out. I can't think of a better way to prep for Halloween than watching the Halloween episodes of Phineas and Ferb. So thanks for joining me as we revisit these. And remember, there's no platypus controlling you. There's no platypus controlling me. Thank you.